I offered a contemplation tonight called Resting in Being as Being. And this is from the book, The Heart of Who We Are. Because I was hoping to support direct experience and inquiry so that there, there was a teaching of sorts in that guiding of direct experience. And for tonight's talk, I thought I'd read you just a bit from the introduction of the heart of who we are, realizing freedom together. Then I very much look forward to moving into open group discussion. It's probably my favorite part of getting to be together in this way. The book starts with this quote, often our own self-realization is the greatest service we can re render the world. In fact, this is a quote from Ramana Maharshi. He doesn't begin with often. He begins simply and cleanly with our own self-realization is the greatest service we can render the world. We all long to be happy. Not happy as in glee, but deep contentment. We all long to feel at ease, to know that we're okay, that life is okay, to be at peace. And we're deeply habituated to look for this happiness, out to grasp and scramble for an experience that at best ends up being fleeting and then something we long for again. We forget that this experience we long for is already seated in the heart of who we are and that it's always here. Have you ever touched this peace, this contentment, this deep knowing of who you truly are and then struggled because you recognized the degree to which the world around you didn't reflect this experience of our true nature? Our true nature, oneness. Spiritual practice reveals the reality of oneness. Part of me feels called to write about this reality and nothing else, to live quietly, to meditate often, to be still, to perhaps make goat cheese on an island in the Puget Sound with my husband and our dogs. Another part of me can't write or teach about this reality exclusively. I am propelled by a deep call to address how in so many spiritual practice settings, this oneness is named yet not necessarily reflected in our daily lives as practitioners. Not to mention how many report feeling overlooked, excluded, and ignored in prominent spiritual communities the realities of their lives unseen, even unwelcome. How can I, a former monk with a lifelong commitment to non-harming, talk about oneness while participating in systems that I recognize as harmful, systems that I can't be teased apart from, how can I speak about this reality of oneness without addressing the ways we often don't act on behalf of this knowing? How can I recognize the privileges afforded to me based on race and class while also coming to terms with the way in which it's not a, quote, privilege to be part of a system of domineering and othering? What do I mean by othering? Actions arising from the perception of separation, behaviors that don't reflect the truth of oneness. This divide speaks to two realities, the reality of interconnection and oneness, the absolute reality, and the reality of isolation and separation, our relative experience, where we enact the shared delusion that we are fundamentally separate from each other on personal and collective levels. These are two truths, the truth of the absolute and the truth of the relative. The relative, the conventional, the material, things as they appear to be. The absolute, the ultimate, things as they truly are, empty. Empty, not 
as in a grim void or kind of nihilism, not nothingness, but empty of objective experience, empty of language, empty of meaning, empty of separateness. Everything comes from something else. Everything is connected to something else. No thing exists in a vacuum. No thing stands on its own. Things simply appear to. Emptiness means empty of limitation. Emptiness means spaciousness. Emptiness means openness. Emptiness, the home of possibility, the great mystery. Where nothing is formed and nothing is known. I'm called to speak to both the absolute and relative realities, to reconcile these truths, to not omit any part of reality. How can our personal and collective practices be employed to not merely transcend the pain of the world, but also to help us accept and be with the pain of the world so we can then transform it? Transforming not only individually, but also collectively. What are the ways that our spiritual practices have been conditioned to have filters, to be byproducts of the very distortions we aim to see through? How can we not only directly experience oneness, but also apply this experience and understanding to address the impacts of the delusion of separation and pain in the world. Most importantly, to not just address the impacts, but also to get to the root issue. I long to live in a world that reflects the reality of oneness rather than the distortion of our shared delusion. To live in a world that reflects the deepest truth of our shared being, a term I first heard from the meditation teacher, Rupert Spira. I know this world from my meditation cushion and in my remote hermitage on the hill, and I know this world from inside the walls of public high school classrooms. What's possible reveals itself in countless ways. And I don't write or speak about anything here that hasn't touched my life directly. Teens who struggle with depression and self-harm, an increasing homeless population in the city where I live, wildfire season, now the norm where so many of us live. Loved ones who are affected by racism daily and the recognition that we're all impacted by racism daily. The pain of seeing how I participate in systems that I recognize as harmful that we all do. This relative plain reality, the reality that is so often reflecting the pain of living on behalf of the belief that we're separate from each other, this reality where we suffer, how might our experience of oneness be brought to bear on this reality? So friends, I pause now. And I invite, please, reflection, insight, question, comment. And it could be a comment question about the meditation or the short reading, or perhaps how they intersect. Okay, Elaine. Thank you. I'm going to ask you to unmute. Hi, Elaine. Hi, Kaverly. That was wonderful. I need to keep the video off because my laptop can shut down. No um, problem. Two, two things came came up for me, if, if that is okay to have two. Um, um, so during the contemplation, and it's been a very, it's been a, a long and somewhat difficult day for me. And so my mind is thinking at the time, um, Awareness should be clear and, um, you know, not blissful, but just clear and open. And, but it feels really dull. 
right now. And, um, you know, like it's sort of there, but I'm really tired. And so it's not clear and it should be clear. And at some point, like I just sort of said to myself, you know, stop with the words, stop with judging it, just let it be. Mm -hmm. And like almost miraculously, things really cleared up and and was light and clear in a in a way that I I would expect if I can use that. And I I thought that was very interesting. The other thing I just want to mention because well, um, Elaine, before you oh, before you go on, can I reflect back your insight? Yes, because please. It's important. I want to I want to comment on that before you bring in another point because. I don't know that I'll be able to track more than what you just shared. <laughs> and that was really rich. It's very, I want to reflect back to you that the way I would say this, Elaine, is in your deepest knowing, you recognize that awareness itself has a quality of clarity. If you were to put words on awareness, you might say it's clear. You experience dullness. And to me, what you're exploring right now, Elaine, is the recognition that when we're identified with the conditioned mind, we project the experience of the conditioned mind onto awareness itself. Mm -hmm. As soon as you accepted that for what it is, as soon as you accepted the experience that was being had, the resistance, which is simply a form that the conditioned mind can take, the resistance that was present fell away. And so what was left is the clarity of awareness itself. I just want to pause you before you move to point two and reflect that back to you because it's significant. You're right. It is, it is worth noting. It's wonderful. <laughs> yeah. The, well, the other thing. Your um, insight. Yeah. Th yeah th thank you. Thank you for that explanation. It does. It, it makes a lot of sense. The other thing, and I don't particularly need an answer because I don't want to take up anybody else's time, but but, but it is a concern, and Rick also will sometimes answer questions like this. There's, there's this sense of oneness, that no boundary, no separation between us. Um, and yet there is this idea of healthy boundaries. Um, so especially if I think if you're an empathetic person, and it can be hard to like sort of say, this is what I'm feeling, this is what you're feeling. And so this wonderful idea of oneness among all, um, you know, versus this idea of healthy boundaries between people is, you know, that that I, I, I can empathize with your pain, but, well, is it my pain or isn't it my pain from this idea of oneness? So, so that's, that's a separate question. Well, Elena, I really am glad you brought this up because the notion that boundaries cannot be applied is a distortion of our understanding of oneness mm, okay. when we're when we're speaking about oneness we're pointing to the nature of our being which is shared but of course we take different form we take this same shared being takes different form on the relative plane so you have a body mind named uh, am i saying your name right elaine Yes. You have a body mind that you and others refer to as Elaine. I have a body mind that I and others refer to as Caverly. Now, if I'm consistently um, breaching the recognition of our shared being in some way, if I've gotten identified with the conditioned mind, it's important that you, from the knowing of our shared being, speak up about that experience or apply a boundary, right? There are all kinds of ways that we can go about mm -hmm. this. So I do want to just clarify that to me is part of a distortion. Oh, we're one. So that should mean anything and everything goes. Or, oh, we're all just awareness or we're all just the same pure consciousness. So I guess I can just go out and sleep with whoever I want. I'm sure my husband won't mind. <laughs> now, of course, not so, right? No, thank you so much for that distinction. You, That's so helpful. Thank yeah, you. thank you so much. Let's okay, move, I think I saw uh, Rick's hand next. Let's move on to Rick. I'm going to ask him to unmute. Great. Hi, Rick. 
Hi, Caverly. Yeah, I did ask my question in the chat. I don't know if you had a chance to take a look at it, but uh, please, not, will you yeah. say it again? I did, but I would love for you to bring sure. it to the group. Well, so first, I, I just want to thank you um, from the bottom of my, of my heart uh, for this contemplative experience uh, where I, I definitely got a, a palpable sense for what I think you were talking about this sense of, you know, focusing on the source as opposed to what the flashlight might be illuminating at the moment. Mm. Uh, and and the power of being uh, in in the present. So so thank you for that. That's it was um, I mean, it's it's I would I would love to be able to recreate this. Mm. I guess that's my question, right? And um, you know, you've spent many, many years uh in you know deep practice daily practice and in, in a monastic setting and i'm wondering you know i'm probably not going to go to you know abandon my you know conventional life and you know, is it possible to um to experience you know this on a more consistent basis without kind of you know committing yourself to like a contemplative practice inside of you know spirit rock or some other monastery i mean and what do you do you know what what do you recommend you know for just like conventional people normal mere mortals as it were you know rick if if i could prompt our exchange to go viral in all spiritual communities i would because i'm so moved by your question because i think so many people have this question and then don't voice it i couldn't sing loud enough from a high enough mountain that one of my greatest insights having been a monastic for eight years was that everyone doesn't need to go be a monastic for eight years <laughs> It's something that was part of my journey and the unfolding of my path. And I couldn't be more clear now that it is not required. And one of the ways that I'm, I've come to this clarity is what I've watched through being the founder of the nonprofit called Peace in Schools, where I see in a semester long mindfulness credited course, the transformation teens go to. Y'all, we never meditate for more than 10 minutes at a time. Mm -hmm. the recognition the remembrance of our being is not something that you must go through countless hoops in order to experience and i truly the reason i'm i say like oh i wish this could go viral is it's it's one of the most important insights of all of my practice the 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 simplicity of knowing our own being is the reason we don't have to go through so many hoops is because we're actually coming home to the remembrance of who we've been all along. And so it's a distortion. It's a it's another version. So Elaine was talking about one distortion. This is an important distortion for us to unre un unveil together, Rick, this, this very commonly shared belief that we must go through step after step after step in order to experience something that we call enlightenment. Mm -hmm. But yeah. of course, at the end, and, and all these things that we yeah. do, all the practices, let me be clear, they're, they're important, they're useful. I've, I've spent a long time cultivating concentration practices, knowing the benefit of those practices. So I want to be super clear. I'm not suggesting that there is not benefit in specific practices, concentrations, practices specifically. Mm -hmm. But what we miss when we get attached to that approach is that we miss, we miss the... I mean, what's right in front of us. We miss what's right here. Yeah. What's right in front of us, we we miss what's right here. We miss what's right now because it's so our very being is so familiar to us that we 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 think it's it's not enough. Mm -hmm. But it's only sure. <laughs> it's only not enough from the conditioned mind that says, no, no, 
enlightenment is some esoteric experience that's off in the future. You have to do much, much more time on the cushion or much more, you have to be, you know, let go of X, Y, and Z in order to have that experience. But has any, have y'all ever noticed that's never quite enough? Mm. Like always that carrot is always just, just, just that much farther away. Uh -huh. So it's well, a, it's would it be okay if I were to challenge you just for a moment? Please, and I know other people have away. many questions, but yeah. Well, please. I guess I guess my my question is simply this: that the minute I, you know, we I this Zoom session is over, I'm going to lose that sense. I know it. You know, I'm pretty sure I'm going to lose that powerful thing of being present and and. It, that sense of awareness. Yes. I, I'm pretty sure I'm going to lose it. So my question is, how can you, how do you keep from losing it? You know? Yes. And, and that is where, you know, so when you and I are first talking, Rick, I'm really talking about something that's almost a non-practice because we're referring to the remembrance of our very being. That yeah. That's not actually something that we really have to do a lot of practice around. And yet the second part of your question brings in the importance of practice and by practice in this case, I'm not talking about hoop after hoop after hoop. I'm talking about the stabilization in the recognition of who we are. Mm -hmm. And this is where it is very, very helpful to consistently place yourself in any setting that helps you remember. I am not someone that says that has to be 24 retreats a year. Mm -hmm. If retreat is supported for you and remembrance for the love of your own being, support yourself by going on retreat. For some people, that's very inaccessible. Yeah. So where is where does remembrance happen for you? Let it truly become woven Re let remembrance become woven throughout your day. And I, mm -hmm. I feel that I can really practically promise that at some point you'll, from love, mm -hmm. you'll just be so motivated to not have your attention going anywhere other than where you recognize all fulfillment lies, that happiness is in your own being. Why would, why would I want to go somewhere else even in a difficult moment maybe especially in a difficult moment why would i why would i want to go anywhere else yeah thank you so much i really really thank appreciate you. your comments yeah. yeah thank you rick i'm so glad you spoke up <laughs> may we may we blow up the internet <laughs> okay <laughs> sure okay we, let's let's go to aaron i'm going to ask okay, you to aaron. unmute hi 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 i I'm going to try to be sort of brief and succinct um, because I feel as though I, I'm just always confused. So I'm, I hope that I'm, I'm going to be clear here. Um, you, how, I'm not sure how I can, how I can say this. Um, I've heard a lot about um, attending and not abandoning the hard emotions, like um, the things that, that make, our addiction so strong, the fleeing that we do when uh, so, uh, uh, something painful comes along. And I don't know the difference between attending and staying with. I don't know the difference between, between with and in. I don't know how to be with something and not be in it. I don't know how to be with my pain and not be in pain and then want to leave. So I don't know how to be, I can be in or out. I can feel it or I cannot, or I can numb it, but I don't know how to be with it and not be in excruciating discomfort. Erin, I understand. What you're saying to me is, is this. I'm going to reflect it back to you in a slightly different way. So I know I can't see you right now, but can you see me? Yes. Okay, great. So here's the pain. It's this, let's just say the pain is this bubble over here. The pain is in the bubble. What you're saying is I'm either, I'm gonna use some props here, okay? I've got, got this 
pair of scissors over here from my desk. I've got this piece of wood that's a little hot plate thing, okay? So yeah. the pain is over here. The pain is this little wood block. What you're describing is- Can I stop you right there? Yeah. That, pain, that pain is not over there. That pain is, I am that pain. No, 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 but, but hang with me here, Aaron. I hear okay. you. So you're saying, here's the pain. I'm either with it, which means I'm experiencing it so fully that it's just, it sounds like it's just all consuming and we can all relate to that, right? Yeah. Or you're describing, I'm, I'm, you're, that would be the sort of I'm in it. Or some people will say, I'm with it from that view of I'm meditating, I'm watching it, I'm observing it. So now you can see I'm, if I am this prop here, I'm sort of hovering over it, but I'm kind of outside it, sort of distanced from it. So what I want to suggest to you is these are not your only choices. In choice one, you're so identified with it that that's, that that's, you see yourself to be the pain. Yes. In choice two, you're hovering above it and you're, you're floating above it in a sense. You're observing it, but you're distanced from it. What I want to suggest to you is that what will be helpful to bring your attention to with this query is not the pain, but it's who are you? When you recognize yourself, as we did in the meditation I guided, when you recognize yourself, the vastness of your being, when you recognize the heart of you, who you are, pain is simply one form that it arises in the vastness of you, in the open. You, without a condemned story, over an experience, describing it, defining it, liking it, not liking it, seeking, resisting, that quote unquote pain is not a problem in the same way. So, Aaron, I want to encourage you to let your inquiry be how might I come back to the reality of who I truly am? Who, who am I? Am I the pain? Am I the thing that just watches pain? You with me? Aaron, are you still with us? I think we've lost the air. No, no, no. I was unmuted there for a reason. Can you still hear me? Yes. Oh, great. Okay. Yes. Um, I was unmuted there, but I heard everything that you said. And yes, I understand. Um, um, and I'm guessing the same would be true for, for physical pain. Because sometimes the physical Absolutely. pain is excruciating. And all you want to do is say, I'm not this. Let me out. Yes. And in that case, the, I don't, I'm not this, it, it, we, as you say, we try to run away from it. But when we yeah. recognize the vastness of our being, all that arises plays a different role within, within the vastness of who we truly are. So Aaron, I would encourage you to keep coming back to this question of what is the heart of me? Who, who am I truly? Thank you, Aaron. Okay, we're going to move on. Next on the queue is Lynn. And I'm going to Hi, ask Lynn. her to unmute. Thank you for tonight, A. Um, you were talking about sort of the vastness and then boundaries earlier. And I had something happen today. And that kind of, I think this is what I experienced, but I'm not sure. Like, I have this thing where I pack around some fives in my wallet because I live where there's a lot of street people. And I, so I was going to Safeway to get groceries and um, there was a guy in a wheelchair and um, I, I thought, okay, he needs help. And so I gave him a little bit of money and that term vastness of being, that's what I experience every time. And it surprises me. Like 
I don't know what it is like my heart opens and their heart opens and it's not anything about the money because how could five bucks make a difference it doesn't I mean it does but it doesn't and so I I went in the store and I got some oranges and some other groceries and then when I came out I thought I've got quite a sore leg so I was in quite a bit of pain and I had this package of oranges and I thought I should open this package of oranges and give him some of these oranges because he was still there kind of had his back to me couldn't see me and and then I thought but I can't my my leg hurts I I can't and then I felt guilty <laughs> and then I felt oh I hope he doesn't see me you know and I, I had all this stuff go through my mind and then then I had this thought, <laughs> which maybe is what you were talking about. Um, I thought, you know, someone else will come along and help him. Mm -hmm. I can't right now, mm -hmm. you know. Um, and just, you know, just to witness his courage and, and just the truth of the situation. And so by the time I actually was in my car and ready to go I was okay mm -hmm. but I kind of traversed a whole bunch of different things <laughs> from vastness of being to all of my own fears to yeah I, I'd be curious to think to ask you what you think of that whole idea of like I come from the whole Christian background so but that's not part of my life anymore but to call on whatever it is that connects all of us to look after this person because I can't right now I've done my part and, yeah. and please someone else come along because he needs help. Yes. Thank you so much for your share, Lynn. I, I mm. hear your care, not only for this person, but for humanity. I hear your, your care for what, when we're identified with the conditioned mind might feel like simply an other. Right? We have to be identified with that conditioned view of separation in order to not see the heart of another person, to not see the heart of who they are, to not recognize the heart of who they are as something that's actually shared. So in that recognition, you're having a moment of love, this collapse of I'm the subject, that person's the object. It's a momentary, mm -hmm. we are together. We, we are made of the same stuff. And so your recognition, your prayer for, I can only help so much on this relative plane. Can someone else come in? Can someone else help? It's a, it's a beautiful prayer. You're calling out to, uh, to anyone else who's recognizing this shared being to also be responsive yeah i and just to add another part here just to finish the picture out i'm fairly aware of how profoundly judgmental i am and so i know both camps very well um and so when i enter into that space it's like oh i can be that way and i could also be profoundly judgmental of people at different times so i'm, I'm kind of the <laughs> i'm the whole gamut <laughs> we all we all are lynn and what we're mm. doing in practice is we're remembering what's actually true about us mm. oh i like that and what's yeah. true about us is that when we're when we're not busy doing something else we naturally love we naturally feel connection we naturally feel a type of happiness without cause, happiness that's not contingent on objects. Thank you.